Welcome to The Switch, not another podcast. The Switch is a collaboration between Baseload Capital and DNB, aiming to accelerate the green transition. We want our podcast to be a central hub for knowledge exchange within the fields of renewables and green transition. Hosted by Kristina Hagström Ilevska and produced by Emil and Jacob. He is one of the founders and the CEO of Ever Technologies. A technology-based energy company that focuses on creating clean, reliable and affordable energy. In this episode we will find out more about how they will make this happen by the help of geothermal energy. He is a man on a mission to change the world for the better. He is a change maker and he is a star. Let's give a warm switch welcome to today's guest, John Redfern. Welcome back to the Switch Not Another podcast with me here today is John Redfern. And uh, the company that you're representing is Ever. Yes. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it. And you are the CEO. CEO and one of the co-founders, along with Paul Cairns. So. Yeah. How long have you had the company? It's about five years. Yeah. Uh, again, it's interesting because uh, startups are like kids. They're always your baby, no matter how old they get. I've, I've got some that are you know, 15, 20 years old, and I still think of them as a startup. But uh, this one's five years, just starting to gain traction. And uh, who knows what the next five years will bring. Hopefully, hopefully lots of... Uh, Good progress. So what do you dream that your baby will do when it becomes a teenager? Change the world. Change the world. Change the world for the better, of yeah. course. It's easy to change the world for the worse, but <laughs> actually for the better is a bigger challenge. Yeah. Can you tell tell me how you want that to be done? And also, I think we should start with the, telling the audience about the product that you also have. Yeah, it's hard to say how we're going to change the world without talking about how we're changing the product. And the way we're changing the product is we're taking something that's a traditional niche energy source, geothermal, and try to make it scalable, trying to make it part of the solution. Because all these technologies are never really useful unless they can be done at scale Mm. they're not affecting the overall climate and you know geothermal has been in this little box where it works in some places like iceland but nowhere else and so it's not really seen as part of the big dialogue with wind solar hydrogen all these other things that are viewed as having global impact Mm. so the question is how do we how tell me if the lantern is getting too long but how do we how do we take geothermal and make it scalable make it global we do that by decoupling it from the geology, from turning it into less of an exploration game, looking for an aquifer that's a you know good reservoir, and instead just looking for a way to harvest heat wherever it is by drilling a big, and I mean big, subsurface radiator that collects the heat by So conduction. what you were just saying here, I just want to rephrase it. So basically you want to make it scalable mm-hmm. by making sure that it is what? By decoupled from the actual geology. So uh, you go down anywhere on the planet, Mm. there's heat. There's not always an aquifer where you can produce water from it. Traditional geothermal looks for that aquifer and then tries to produce hot brine from it the same way oil and gas tries to produce oil and gas Mm. from a reservoir. We're not doing that. We're just drilling down, drilling out this huge 50 kilometer long radiator Mm. and allowing water to circulate it through it through a natural thermosiphon effect and as it goes through this huge radiator it collects heat directly via conduction from the subsurface and you can then use that for district heating district cooling generating electricity whatever you want as you bring the heat to the surface so what's very special and unique about your product is that you're drilling very deep correct drilling deep But the main thing is that we're not looking for a reservoir. We're not an exploration game. We're not like oil and gas or traditional geothermal. We're a manufacturing process. We're just drilling out a radiator and you build a radiator anywhere that's deep and hot. Mm. You're going to be able to harvest energy forever. Mm. So do you think that this is why there is a misconception about geothermal energy? 
Yes. Uh, the, the, you know, the misconception is why hasn't it been more successful to date, especially mm. with oil companies, because we're taking all the same skill set that oil companies have, exploring the subsurface, drilling, you know, constructing stuff, dealing with subsurface risk, and we're applying that to a green technology. They should be all over this, but they have not up to now because they viewed it as niche. Chevron themselves, they just recently invested with us now because they can see it's scalable, but they sold all their geothermal assets you know, six, seven years ago mm. because it wasn't going anywhere. Nowhere big anyways. So do you think like a product like the Everloop can actually be a part of like switching over that then? Yes, it's, it's helping, helping the oil industry switch over. We're here at Sarah Week. And a whole bunch of different oil companies and oil service companies are now placing bets on various geothermal startups. That was not what it was five years ago. Five mm -hmm. years ago, we were sort of the poor country cousins of other renewables. You mm -hmm. know, they say, oh, geothermal, here they come again. Yes, they're base load, but they don't scale. Mm -hmm. Well, now people, they haven't been proven they can scale at super competitive prices. That's what we're trying to do. But at least they're entertaining the possibility that, oh, maybe these guys have something. Mm -hmm. And some of the other geothermal entrepreneurs have a way of making it more but what Scaling. changed them? What what changed from them not being interested to becoming interested? Because up to now, what we're doing was deemed to be impossible or not economic or whatever. And we're slowly changing people's minds through demonstrations, through you know, proving out the thermodynamic modeling, have all the national labs, double checking our work and everything else. And as well, the other thing that's happened in the last 10 15 years is the oil industry has got a lot better at drilling holes rapidly mm -hmm. and you t and doing it directionally and intersecting wells and doing all that all the building blocks that we need to do to construct this radius subsurface radiator efficiently and so to a certain extent if we tried to do this 10 15 years ago it wouldn't have been possible but because we're riding the coattails of the oil industry on the technological advances they've made we can now do it now, or we've proved, or we're convincing people we can do it. But the other thing that's happened, you always need the technical capability to do something, but you also need a market to sell into. Mm -hmm. And the market didn't exist before because we didn't have wind and solar. So it's a little paradoxical, but we only exist because wind and solar have been successful. With two cent or very cheap, they've become very competitive. Two cents a kilowatt hour, is you know a reasonable target for wind or solar mm. longer term we will never Maybe that they can compete with oil then because that, they can yeah. compete with oil because they they're cheap enough and scalable enough that they are taking an appreciable part of the electrical grid and once they do that at their two cents a kilowatt hour mm. that actually creates a market for us at six cents a kilowatt hour now that's that sounds crazy bullshit right how, how can <laughs> someone you. selling two cents an hour enable a market for six cents an hour. It's because that two cent electricity is displacing gas and coal and nuclear and things that were solid base load performers. Mm. So wind and solar has lowered the overall cost of the grid of the electricity coming out of it, but the end consumer hasn't seen it because how do you replace all that base load power they're displacing? You need a green alternative you know, that can go in there, that is scalable, that is reliable, that is baseload, that is dispatchable. That's us. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that for six cents an hour and, and blend that with some wind and solar, you can have a completely green grid. But there was no market for us before. Because when you're starting with a fully, you know, let's say gas powered or coal powered grid, you know, it makes no sense to put in geothermal right away. The cheapest, you, you, you pick the low-hanging fruit as you're going green, and the low-hanging fruit is wind and solar. But we're reaching the limit of that, and we need this baseload alternative. Can the future then be an alternative where you have an ecosystem with sun, wind, and baseload, and the cost is four cents in, combi in combinations? Yeah. yeah, that's the idea. And in fact, it can even be cooler than that, because you know, we, unlike wind and solar, we don't just create electricity. We can also cre create heat. So mm. let me paint a scenario for you. Think of all the uh, data centers. Mm. You know, as we virtualize the world, more and more energy is going into data centers. Huge amounts of energy. Way more. You know, data centers spend more on electricity than they do on computers, which is sort of mind blowing when you think about it. Definitely. But you know what they do is they need baseload power, but mm. they also need a lot of cooling because all that computing power is generating heat. Mm. So the ultimate solution 
to, do, to power data centers is not solar with a pile of batteries. That's not environmentally clean and it's not very cost effective either. It's you take solar, which can count for about 30% of the electricity, because mm -hmm. that's about their load factor, 30 or 35, and they cover everything in the midday. You build an ever loop below that, which can then dispatch around the solar peak and fill in you know, the uh, solar power after dark, as we call it, right? Mm -hmm. Or 24-7 power. So it fills in the, the evening and the morning when the sun's not so high. And then you take, the, after you strip that electricity, electric power out of the hot water we have, the, origin, the residual heat, you go and put it through an absorption chiller and directly create cooling, which about 30 or 40% of the demand in a, in a data center is for cooling. Mm. So that blended price between direct cooling, between ever generated uh, electricity and solar generated electricity is 100% green and about four cents a kilowatt hour blended price. Mm. So again, that's an so example a of solar. perfect example of an ecosystem, I would say. Yeah. And that's created because, you know, that's because solar has been a successful, it's a perfect complement for us. It creates the market and we can satisfy that market with all the advances that we're borrowing from the oil industry. So it's mm. a perfect storm, all comes together at the same time. And that's why geothermal's hot right now. Good. Mm. So thank you, Greta, and all the other things that happened. Right. Yeah. yeah. We couldn't have done it without, without wind and solar. Mm. That's a, that's a very fresh perspective, I must say. And I think that uh, <coughs> uh, it's a perspective that we haven't talked too much about in, in that mm. part. I think that, as you say, one thing needs to lead to another all the time. Right. It's There's quite a time, interesting. time for everything. How do you feel that the Everloop has been accepted as, at this point? It's grudgingly. Mm. Grudgingly. You know, when I've, I first stumbled into this, I wasn't a long-term geothermal advocate. I was more a... Data, data startup guy and an oil and gas guy. And I was actually quite shocked when I first came in and said, oh my God, I think geothermal is the future of energy. And everyone laughed. And then I said, oh, but you don't understand, you know, closed loop geothermal is the future of geothermal, which is the future of energy. And they went, you can't be serious. So <laughs> there was extreme skepticism, especially from people who are geothermal advocates in the past. Geothermal had been stuck in this sort of niche mentality for decades and decades and decades. And that, when you have that, of course you're gonna be resistant to change. Of mm. course you're gonna view everything as a zero sum game. If that guy gets a grant, means I don't get a grant. They weren't in you know, expansionist sort of mindset that you need to be a VC, that you need to be an entrepreneur, that you need to get a new technology going. Mm. And so, ironically, it was very difficult uh, at the start, first of all, they said the thermodynamics wouldn't work, and then we proved it did numerous times with numerous outside experts. Everyone came around. Then the main concern is, you know, well, economically, really, will it work? We think we're convincing of that, them of that slowly, and that's where the oil companies come in because they're used to starting with things like shale drilling that start to be very expensive, but they know. If it's a repetitive process like that, they can get it down cheaper and cheaper. So they believe, and they're funding the next step. So it's finally getting there. But again, it's interesting. The people who were the traditional geothermal advocates, they're very much still stuck on the EGS as being the solution. And mm. EGS, that involves a lot of reservoir modeling. EGS that being? Enhanced geothermal exactly. solutions. So mm. basically, the two different visions of geothermal going forward is one is ours, Mm. which is this closed loop idea, which is radically different. Or the other one is, I would paraphrase as doing traditional geothermal, but better. Mm. So it's still producing brine from an aquifer, but instead of relying on natural uh, permeability in that, you go in and you frack it mm. to enhance, to stimulate the, the well. Mm -hmm. And that's a very traditional way of thinking, but it's also a way that's failed for decades. Mm. Now, there's some new tools, you know, people like Fervo and that are importing some new tools from the oil patch and they, they're, they're fighting their own battles and convincing people that it's gonna be different this time, just like we're trying to convince people that our solution is different. And, you know, hope, hopefully they're successful as well too. Mm. You know, Can I call them the one? Oh, uh, I, I'm just thinking because you have such an interesting point here. What you're saying here is that you're coming with new technology, new ideas, mm. and you have to fight Old ideas, well, in a sense. Who were the people who, to really go back, who were the people who fought Galileo the most? 
they were the traditional astronomers because mm. this violated what they believed. Mm. And they also had some very good reasons to do it. You know, they would say, we don't believe in Gal Galileo because show me the stellar parallax. Mm -hmm. Stellar parallax, oh, using shit. a weird word, <laughs> is that if the Earth was actually moving around the sun rather than the sun moving around the Earth, why can't we see that where you know stars that are farther away move differently than the ones closer by. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the fact, the reason there was a good reason, because they were unbelievably far away. But you couldn't convince people of that in the past. So they had good arguments, but they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's good arguments as to why what we're trying to do was very difficult in the past. But there's very good reasons why we're able to overcome that now. Mm -hmm. Same way electric cars didn't make sense in the past, but a number of technological advances mean that EVs are the thing. We're like EVs. Do you feel like you have to fight this all the time? Because you, you are a visionary company, let's be honest about that. You're, you're quite we like to think we are anyways, yeah. but huh? <laughs> we like to think we yeah. are. But again, even for ourselves, what we're talking about is so ridiculously simple, we have to pinch ourselves and say, is this really that revolutionary? Mm. Yeah, but sometimes the simplest ideas are the best. But. Mm. You got, uh, we had you on a show for from Basel Capital a couple of... Um, yeah, seems like forever ago. Yeah, seems like forever. <laughs> <laughs> but Vinod Kosla said, he said, the future, mm. he believed, is deep drilling. Yeah. And, and Vinod Kosla has invested a lot of money within... Yeah, he's done a lot of that with Alta Rock and Enquays and uh, so with some other people there. And his idea is a very simple one. Mm. He says, says to me, says to everyone, John, you know, if you can make drilling costs linear, mm. meaning that each kilometer you go deeper is the same price as the last kilometer, mm. we've won. Because mm. the power potential of that deep, super hot rock goes up exponentially. Mm. So it's just a question of drilling deep enough. Mm. And I agree with him on that, but we're doing a whole bunch of things. We still got this closed loop concept that allows us to go everywhere. Of course, when we originally designed it, we were thinking about it saying, well, we're doing this so we can put geothermal in places where it can't so usually can go, to go, Norway, Sweden, go everywhere. everywhere. But at the start, everything's still expensive. So at the start, you want to cherry pick the low hanging fruit and mm -hmm. the low hanging fruit are places where drilling costs are low, like the Western US mm -hmm. and where there's high geothermal gradients, so mm. you don't have to drill too deep for the particular temperature. Mm. So we can go anywhere, but all our early projects are actually focused on hot areas, traditional mm. areas. And in fact, most of where we're focusing on at the moment are failed or geothermal projects that haven't li lived up to their potential. Mm. So whether it's a project in, in Germany or ones in Japan or ones in the Caribbean, like in St. Vincent, Basically, we've got about a dozen projects that we're pushing along that are all places where traditional geothermal, where they had one, two, three wells drilled and found heat but no water. Or they've actually got to the point of creating a, a power plant, but then the production of heat drops off too quickly because mm. traditional geothermal always has that risk. So we're going for the, the, the same spots at the start, but again, we're looking to go as deep and as hot as possible. And that's why we're drilling a test well with some of our technological ideas this summer. Where we're going to go down seven kilometers to about 350 degrees C. So that'll be the deepest geothermal well in history and a bloody hot one at that too. Mm -hmm. So we're doing all these other things, but like uh, Vinod, we're also, and, and the people he's backed at Quays and that like Carlos, we're also going for hot as well. Mm -hmm. Hot makes every geothermal, you know, the hotter it is, the better it is for any geothermal project. And the faster, deeper, cheaper, hotter we can drill, the better for us. Mm. So if other people like Quays are developing other technologies that can allow us to do that, we're more than happy to incorporate, it, incorporate that as part of our business plan to make our overall model better. Interesting. You just answered my uh, my question here. Oh. Uh, maybe you want to add something to it. What's the next step forever? The next step is uh, two things. One, to finalize our grant funding, which we should know about in the summer for Garrett's Reed. And if we get that, you know, we will have a project there where we're going to be putting two, two drill rigs on site and drilling for the next four years, nonstop without moving, you know. This one one ever loop after another, move over a little bit, drill another one, drill a bunch of the same ones directionally. So 
you look at that, we will, by the time we're finished that project, we will have drilled hundreds of kilometers of subsurface well bore. Well, that's so we, a lot of intellectual property. The, that's, a, that's, and well, because this is a type of stuff, just like shale drilling, where you, impl you know, you innovate through implementation, you practice, you <laughs> practice gets perfect. It's not through some intellectual brilliant idea. It's just a lot of little fine tuning. Mm. So we're going to have four years of that in that one spot. And then, as I said, we have this other test well that's uh, going to go in in the Western US uh, this July and August, and that'll test how good we are at drilling, drilling into hot rock. We think we can do one better than Vinod. We think we can make those costs go sublinear. I, we think we can drill faster and cheaper the hotter it gets. So that's, that's gonna be, that'll, that'll definitely satisfy Vinod's criteria, so. It's gonna be a couple of exciting years ahead. Yeah, well, it'll be, it'll be an exciting year right now. And then, mm -hmm. I, then I think we'll see a lot of uh, momentum develop, we mm -hmm. hope. For that. I can imagine that it's also, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's quite intense. It's a little nerve wracking. Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, quite frankly, we're, we're trying a lot of things. Some of them work, some of them don't. You know, we did try some other drilling technology ideas last year that didn't work at all. Mm. But, you, you know, when you run into those, you got to fail fast. Don't keep going down the wrong path. And, you know, our central idea has not changed at all. Mm. You know, five years ago, we saw enough encouraging angles to this whole closed loop idea that we just made a bet, like you're supposed to do in a startup. We just mm -hmm. bet that the future was closed loop, period. And then that has opened all these other avenues for, for exploration where we said, okay, what are all the different things we can do to fine tune that? How can we optimize that? Mm -hmm. How can we optimize that with the, sub, with the surface org system? How can we improve the drilling fluids? How can we improve the working fluids? How can we you know, seal these wells cheaper than using casing? How can we you know, get better drilling technology? So there's, how can we restructure the way these things are even financed? Mm. So there was all, there's dozens of different things that we do and we don't really care what other people do elsewhere. We just, we know we're making the bet, we're swinging for the fences. We know that closed loop is a solution and that frees us to think of all the ways to improve closed loop. And there's a lot more, there's a lot more than we thought. and. Uh, I think that that's like one of the best advice mm. for future startups. I hope right. that that's, that's a segment that they will listen right. to in a sense, because I think that mm. making a bet on something and then looking at the possibilities make things yeah. so much more different. Yeah, I mean, and don't get me wrong, you got to pivot. But, yeah. And we've pivoted in all the tactical stuff, you know, but the central thing, the strategic goal, that's never changed. Never it's, doubt it. Never doubted. Good. I'll see what you doubt now. <laughs> if you doubt yourself or if we should, because I have some kind of uh, personal questions. Are you okay. ready for that? Uh, okay. Now it's time for conscious questions. Tell me now, John Redfern, what, what do you pick? Do you want to tell me about what you've done good for the climate this week? Or if you've seen something really bad done to the climate? Or do you want to tell me about your guilty pleasures? Well, it, it has to be to the time? guilty pleasures, of course. But oh. uh, I, I mean, uh, on a global scale, you know, the bad thing for the climate this week, as we sit here at Sarah Week, mm. it's high oil prices. Sure, that helps us, but it, it makes it very easy to backslide on a lot of other things. And, you know, mm. I've certainly heard a lot of that, that, and you know that people are gonna go, okay, prices are up, it's party time again, let's start, and their investments going back into oil and gas and everything else. But that's just part of the give and take of the oil, oil market, it always goes up and down. When it comes to my guilty pleasure, mm. I travel a lot. So, you know, I haven't for the last two years, but you know, I'm traveling a lot again, and I used to live, like say, in China, I used to live in Europe, used to circle the globe. I got, got all those frequent flyer awards and everything else. And as you know, you can do whatever, you know, good things you want green wise for the environment. But if you were flying as much as I do, the carbon footprint is like massive. Mm -hmm. And I would always get in these arguments with a bunch of my green friends, uh, like Duncan, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> who, who will live, you know, they're, they're green advocates, but they will live off in the countryside heating their house with sustainable harvests from local forests, and they'll have a big, you know, 
truck to do all their driving and they have to drive 50 miles to the grocery store and all that. That's not an efficient, you know, low carbon lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, it's all sustainable forests. I said, yeah, I live in China with 1.3 billion people. We can't live off sustainable forests because it's not scalable. It's not mm -hmm. a scalable solution. And, you know, I, so, so my, I justify it by saying, I was living in China in a 50-story building, you know, walking everywhere and taking public transit everywhere in a much more low-carbon lifestyle. But then I blew it all on the air miles. <laughs> <laughs> so you give somewhere, you get somewhere. Yeah, exactly, so exactly. Because yeah. really, if we care about the environment, we, shouldn't, we should be all sticking to uh, virtual conferences. Mm. But we're sick of virtual conferences, so mm. we, it's everyone's guilty pleasure. You think the future is the hybrid? Well, obviously, there's got to be more and more virtual stuff mm -hmm. done, but you still, it's still useful to occasionally have uh, these conferences. Mm -hmm. But I think the way you rationalize it is you make sure those conferences, when you do do them, are that much more mm -hmm. special than everything else. You don't just travel just to say hi or mm -hmm. travel for one sales meeting or something. You make it an event when it's you go. It's more smart, yeah. 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 And something like Sarah is great like that because you mm -hmm. meet everyone on the planet mm -hmm. in the energy industry in the same week, in mm -hmm. the same spot. So it's that highly efficient. Yeah. Are you, um, when it comes to all these the things, uh, thinking about switching to green and, and that, are you optimistic? Yeah, yeah, I am. What do you base that on? Optimism. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one. No, no, no but people are as, uh, you know, as happy as they want to be, you mm. know, and they're as optimistic as they want to be. You can always look at, you know, it's a glass half full versus half empty type of thing. Mm -hmm. You can do that with anything. So is there a rational reason for that? Yeah, there's a, to a certain extent, there is a rational reason in that if you look statistically, the globe is a better place than it's been ever before. Yeah, we got war in Europe and all that, but if you look at the overall statistics and long-term trends, life is getting better for a greater number of people. Isn't that interesting that we are, we're so caught up with the negative things happening around us that we don't actually see that the world well, is in a better state than yeah, it has and, ever been? And the problem with that is if we're taking that negative view, it tends to look for negative solutions. Mm. I think you asked me this earlier, but you know, the negative solution is instead of finding a way to make power that's greener and more efficient and more environmentally friendly, we just say, oh, we're just going to reduce everything. Right. Mm. Where would the world be if we said the solution to the whaling problem is we're going to live within our means of a sustainable whale harvest every year and not look mm. for other energy sources? It'd be, that's ridiculous. Mm. You know, and it's equally ridiculous now to sit there. You know, the way mankind gets better, the reason it's getting better in this long term is because of the vector of technology. That's what makes it not a cyclical, repeatable forever never going forward it's because things are different because technology is an accretive process and the better you get get along that the more you advance the more solutions that are there and mm. when i when i was young there was since we're talking about my birthday there were three billion people on the planet mm. there's way more than that but back when there was only three billion people instead of whatever it is now seven, seven or eight yeah, yeah um we were told we we're going to run out of everything. We we're going to run out of minerals. We we're going to run out of food. People were starving every day. I was told, you know, to eat my peas because there's some hungry kid in China who wants them. And I, as a kid, I always doubted that. But, you know, it was true. <laughs> They've gone from something that was very basic sustenance living food-wise, the iron rice bowl, and are now all traveling the world and eating in luxury restaurants. And the world hasn't imploded. imploded. Why? Because of technological advance. So we can't turn our back on that. And that's what gives me optimism. That's what gives me confidence that tomorrow will on average be different than today and slightly better. There are though uh, a slight sense of urgency in the situation. Well, more what than conversation? Slight. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of conversation, what kind of uncomfortable conversations do you believe that we need to have in order to ma manage the switch? Well, we got to we got to look at the whole pie you know the problem is a lot of this gets driven just through you know financial markets and you know a lot of the hype is around wind solar hydrogen and all that is people are looking at making a lot of money doing it mm. and you know we gotta we gotta look sometimes a little bit more and make sure those market forces are pushing us in the right direction because you know a place like california just putting in more solar isn't really going to improve stuff you got to look at the overall 
quality of life and things that we're doing. And one of the things that frustrates me is our sales pitch is a little more complicated. You know, we can't just say, look, we're got the world's lowest LCOE. Solar has, wind has that. We don't have that, but we are adding this dispatchability element. We're at our loading, you know, we're, we're doing something that has much smaller mining tail on the end of it. We don't use all these rare earths, minerals, and other, you know, lot, lots of other, we're not making mining companies mm -hmm. rich while, the, while, while impoverishing yeah. oil companies. We're reducing the need for mining and, and oil companies and um, everything else. Or just the very fact that, you know, we're a green technology that doesn't take up a lot of surface area. Mm. You know, what's the point of getting green power if everywhere you look, every bit of countryside is covered with windmills and solar panels? And I know they got lots of extra space in the Western U.S., but, you know, we want a solution that works for Europe, that works for places like Singapore as well. There's just not enough space on the planet if you try to do everything via wind and solar and a bunch of mega batteries mm. that has its own environmental cost and its own detriment to the quality of life. So, Do you think that people have too little patience to understand? You said our, our pitch is not yeah. easy as a solar and, and wind. And that's, that's on us. We, we have to... We have to be better at pitching things simply. We, as yeah. in the industry, as in the industry, industry yeah. and we can't just say, "Oh, we're green and baseload," and hope expect everyone to fall over themselves. Mm -hmm. We got to show how it fits in the overall grid, the overall market, how it, you know, how it helps in some of the harder to fulfill markets, like the heating market. Mm -hmm. You know, in Northern Europe, the heating market's as big as the electricity market, mm -hmm. and we're even more competitive in that than we are in electricity. But mm -hmm. we haven't done it yet or we haven't done it to scale because it takes time. Every town's a new sale, right? Mm -hmm. But the good thing is, I believe over the next year or two, we're gonna get over the hump and then it's gonna change. The psychology will change and it'll go from, you know, convince me why I should do geothermal to, oh, how am I gonna justify not doing geothermal and doing something like biomass that is mm -hmm. clearly not the ideal solution and yet it's being used because it's got some history, it's there. Mm -hmm. There, you know, people people know how to handle it, and they know they know for sure it's going to work. Yeah, you know, we have to show that for sure we're going to work too. What kind of leadership do you believe it's going to take to do that? Do we have the right leaders right now, or? Well, I mean, part of the problem with leadership, if you're talking in the political sense, is this is a big problem that takes time to solve. And if you're in a two-year or four-year electoral cycle. You know, it's like, do people have, you know, leaders, leaders don't purposely do the wrong thing, but they've got to get elected. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, traditionally that was one of the problems with geothermal. The average geothermal plant traditionally took five to 10 years to bring online. You know, what politician wants to bet on that, right? No, no, no. So his, his, you know, his successor will take credit for that one. Um, so it's, 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 I don't really want to blame the leaders. We have to find ways of, of working with those limitations. And one of the advantages we're trying to do by taking that exploration phase out is to get it down to more of a two to three year implementation plan that can fit better with politicians and people's timelines. We're all impatient. It's not just the po politicians are impatient because we're impatient. Right. So if I mean, if we have because uh, uh, the the audience we have are investors, developers, and, and regular people mm -hmm. on the street, what would be your advice to them? Fun, fun geothermal. Uh, well, the interesting thing, and I go back to this many times, is that traditional oil and gas and traditional geothermal requires a high rate of return. Why? Because it's high risk. There's mm. a geological risk. There's the operational risk, even once it's up and running. You know, if you're a bank or something, yeah, we got a little bit of technological risk we're squeezing out of the system, but we really are identical to wind and solar from a financial perspective. Mm -hmm. So if you're a banker, you're looking at what are we producing, you know ahead of time what we're going to produce energy-wise for the next 20 years or even before we build the plant, just like you do with wind and solar. If you commission a solar plant, you don't know what it's going to produce on a particular day, mm -hmm. but you know for sure the average amount it's going to produce in a year. And predictable revenues mean predictable finances means you can have lots of debt loading it up and you can expect a low rate or, you know, a low uh, interest discount rate applied to it, mm. which makes it more financeable. So when you're tired of, you know, earning negative margins on solar 
solar developments or wind developments, which is where it's getting because everyone's piling in there and the market's maturing. Yeah. Come over to us. We're still get, we're still offering uh, you know double digit uh, returns. You project returns. You heard it from from John Redfern. But the sale won't last. You got to get in early. <laughs> if you wait there. another five, ten years, it's going to be just like wind and solar. You'll miss the boat. Do we have an early bird discount? Yeah, an early bird discount. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I uh, want to drop us over to the disruption question. Ooh. Are you ready? Now it's time for the disruptive question. In contrast to many contemporary climate change debates, it is a false binary to talk about supporting economic growth or protecting the environment. How do you change? How do you challenge people to see these goals and that they are not? Hey, sh- <coughs> we, we already answered. We already answered that one. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about the vector of technology and why you know I'm optimistic and everything else. It's it is a false uh, binary choice. It is, in fact, the opposite of that. The only way we're going to handle this and the only way we're going to progress is through technology mm. and through development and through progress. It's not, we're not, we're not going to, you know, save the world by going back to sustainable forests. Mm. Sustainable forests are great. They can be part of it, but they're not going to save the world. We're going to be able to afford to do that and have sustainable forests because we got modern uh, agriculture. We don't need to chop down all rainforest to mm. grow food and stuff like that. So I'm I'm definitely a believer in progress, believer in technology, and uh, I don't you know sort of Greta and I diverge on this one. But uh, you know I don't think just living living a smaller life and smaller ambitions is what inspires people, and it's not not the future. Once we do that. You know, I think we're we're into a negative negative spiral. Good, thank but, you. Uh, and I actually uh, on a previous podcast we had Microsoft with oh, us. Okay, yeah. And it's quite interesting because they have the same perspective right. as you, and and they were also taking examples of exactly what you did, like how it was three million going to seven million, yeah. and what catastrophic thoughts, and how actually the technology has reshaped our world. There's but it's no interesting, limit to human ingenuity. No yeah. limit, but it's interesting that we don't see that hmm. when we're looking forward. We can right. look back at it and say, oh, this was a good invention, but yeah. it's so difficult to look forward to it. Absolutely. How do we give the people the courage to stop thinking? Oh. Well, I mean, part of the part of the problem is you know bad news is this a lot more watchable than good news? Hmm. You know, and I think it's it's a whole media thing. You know, people people have to get used to this modern media environment with social media and everything else, and get develop proper filters, and we will over time. Hmm. You know, a very famous Canadian was Marshall McLuhan. He said the medium is a message. And he's saying the very way we consume information is more important to our general mindset than what the information itself is. And things like all the great dictators grew up in the 30s and stuff like that. Was that because there had been a worldwide recession? That was part of it. But it was also because it was the era of radio. And radio was a hot media that was ideally attuned to demagogues like Hitler, like Stalin, like, like well, Bible Bill Eberhardt in Alberta. You know, it was a worldwide phenomenon. And the same thing right now as we learn to consume social media, we got to build up a filter that we got to realize most of what we're reading is complete and utter bullshit. Mm. But people haven't built those filters yet and we'll adapt to it. And, you know, it's, it, we, we always go through this phase when the internet first came in, we said, this is going to make everything better. And then all of a sudden we realized, oh no, it's going to make everything worse. Hmm. And we'll reach an equilibrium eventually. But people are the lagging indicator here. We have to, you know, catch up ourselves to where things are going. But uh, I'm still optimistic. How do does a... Sorry, we got, got a, no. little, meh, a little off topic there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's really interesting. And I, I, my last question on that was actually... How do we encourage the like the commoner, every person on the street, to to adapt to what you just said? What do you need to do? Yeah, and that's interesting because people like to feel they're doing something, mm. you know. And so, what, a lot of the we talked about the different approaches to climate change. You know, some that are sort of pro technology, and others mm. that are more change your lifestyle. <laughs> the big advantage of the change your lifestyle thing is it's something everyone can do. 
And so that's what makes it a nice complement to the whole thing because people like to feel that they're doing good. People like to feel that they themselves are somehow helping out because if they feel they themselves are helping out, sometimes they feel less powerless. Whereas a lot of the big technology solutions are you know, indifferent to people's individual efforts. So somehow we got to marry those two things together and uh, you know, sometimes that comes together in uh, geothermal if you've got geothermal heat pumps. You know, mm. Those are very popular in Northern Europe and Scandinavia. And there you're taking geothermal energy, but you're getting to build it on your own house. So people feel, oh, I'm doing my, my thing. And we got to find more ways of, of doing that uh, and more ways of people uh, feeling part of that. Well, to which people. I announce our new funding round and we're do uh, crowdsourcing so everyone can own a bit of ever. Maybe that's it, but uh, I don't know. Whoa, really? Well, I, we've been discussing it, but I, I, it hasn't happened yet. But that's, that would be an example. Stay tuned. That, that could be an example of where people can feel they're part of it and uh, you know, still, still embrace the technological progress. So I, I know people in my company are saying we should do that. And they're going to say, oh, John, you, you, we finally cracked you. But uh, <laughs> who knows? There have been people. Uh, recent examples of other technolo technology companies like ourselves on the green side that have raised money in the crowdsourcing mm. field. So maybe, like I say, maybe that's a way of bringing those two threads together. People wanting to be personally involved and the technological advance. It's always something new coming up when I sit down with you and meet. It's always an <laughs> we're announcement making it up. or something. We're making, we're, we're making it up live <laughs> as we go along. That's why. Well, that's I, good. Yeah. It's, it's always a pleasure. We're moving towards the end. Oh, but okay. uh, one of the last segments is where you get to choose a company to give sunshine to. A company or an initiative or a person. Who would you like to raise some sunshine to? Sunshine. Well, I think the sunshine I got to raise is for my other geothermal collaborators, you know, whether it was Carlos over at Quays or Tim at Fervo or Joe at Greenfire or Lev and Lance at Sage. You know, I know I've complained about some of the headwinds we've faced. I know they've all faced similar headwinds and they've all started before. I mean, there's a lot of people jumping on board now, but all these other people I mentioned jumped on a little before it became flavor of the week mm. and, you know, wrist, wrist, ridicule from their own colleagues and that, and have persisted. And everyone's got a slightly different take on how to solve the geothermal or crack the geothermal nut. Uh, but I'd like to salute them for you know being pioneers and along with ourselves, because them being pioneers at the same time as us also helps us too. Hmm. And other advice to the young startup people there, if no one else is trying to do what you're doing, it's probably, you're probably on the wrong track, you know, because if, if, you know, okay, for the first six months or a year, but after that, if there's not other people trying to emulate you, then I get worried. Because if there's one, one thing that you know is, you know, success has many fathers, failure an orphan. You don't want to be an orphan in technolo technologically, which sort of goes against everything people instinctively feel when they get into it. They say, no, I'm going to have a unique solution. I'm going to control it. No one else is going to compete with me because I'm, I'm the only one doing it. That never happens. But there's a happy medium. You know? mm. I mean, I, living in China, that was one of the things I noticed. I'd go around from town to town. Everyone would think that their local tech sector was unique and not realizing they really had to find something that, yeah, you don't want to be the only one doing it, but you want to have some competitive advantage against other people and you want to be one of a few who's capable of doing it. The example I always use, remember, remember Groupon? Mm-hmm. How many Groupon clones do you think there were in China? Oh, oh. when you say like that, it must have been many. So. Uh, over over 5,000. <gasps> I was so. thinking, I was, I was going for 500 because then I thought, no, 5,000. Yeah, over 5,000. Wow. And But, you know, in almost anything, if it's too generic, we're living in a wired world now, everyone will jump in. There's lots of entrepreneurs, mm. you know, millions of them, and they're looking for any angle. So you need something that you have a competitive advantage on, something that not everyone can emulate, like a Groupon. Uh, and you got to realize, you know, you want to look for other fellow travelers. And in this case, the group I mentioned is perfect because they're all trying to crack the same nut, but they're all bringing their own unique technological spin to it that they have some unique background in. 
you know, Sage is very good at doing vertical frack. So they've come up with a solution that that's the core of the whole product, product, mm. right? That's what you have to do. You gotta have some advantage, like all these people do, and then strike out before it's popular. Because if you have a niche that looks good, you know, it's probably, unless you have some really weird competitive advantage, it's probably not that good, because if it was good, someone would have done it already, right? Mm. But, uh, so it's, it's good to have a little bit of a ugly duckling, as we would say in English, like geothermal was. Find out how to make that better. You know, then you know, there may be some opportunities lurking there. Be proud of your ugly yeah. duckling. Ugly ducklings, they could turn into a swan. I think those were, uh, that could be actually famous last words. What, what do you bring with you from <laughs> well, today's the, conversation? The, the interesting thing on the swan side, of course, is part of our story was, you know, one of the guys we had who was our early convertees was a guy whose job title at Shell was Black Swan Detector. So uh, that's always good. If you got someone named the Black Swan Detector on your side, you're, you're onto something. I'm going to go look for a black swan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you summarize today's conversation? A lot of fun. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Okay. What do you bring with you? What, what are your motivations for the day now? My motivations for the day are to get back to Sarah Week and uh, do a little bit more networking and then um, have some birthday cake. I hope you will enjoy that birthday cake and maybe even get a present or two. If I'm, I, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Good. Thank you very much, John, for, for yeah. coming to the Switch Not Another podcast. It's been an honor and a privilege to discuss with you again. So Thanks for having me here. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.